Well, good morning once again. Brethren, we're all aware of the admonitions in the Scriptures talking about the importance of being an overcomer. Over and over this expression is used. We're told of the necessity to him that overcomes uh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, Christ says in Revelation 3, uh, to him that overcomes. In fact, if you go through Revelation chapter 2 and 3, what you find is that in the message to every one of the seven churches, Every single one of the seven churches, one point is absolutely the same. The concluding message to each church is to him that overcomes. To him that overcomes. There is the necessity, the scriptures show, the necessity for all Christians of all times, of all ages, there is the necessity for all of us to overcome, to grow, to go forward. And yet, inevitably, every single one of us find ourselves at various times absolutely bogged down and seemingly unable to really move forward. Have you ever felt that way? Just felt like that you weren't making the progress you ought to make? And, of course, sometimes some people uh, just are are continually sort of reviewing themselves and sort of beating themselves up that way. Uh, Others uh, seemingly don't ever give it a thought. And... uh, uh, there is a, a balance somewhere in between. But it is important that we that we recognize that and that we understand that there are things that can stand in the way and block growth. There are things that can block our forward progress in life, can block us becoming more and more the kinds of people we need to be, the kind of husband, the kind of wife, the kind of father or mother, or employee, or friend. There are things that can stand in the way, and there are things that sidetrack the lives of some people, and they never, ever go forward. And there are those that seemingly uh, are able, after certain things, to uh, to go forward and to make a certain progress. You know, to begin with, let's go back to the book of Ephesians. And let's understand that we have a model, we have uh, a pattern that is to be the basis of our growth. And what God is after in our life is not change simply for change's sake. It's change in the sense of progress because you know people can change for the worse. People can deteriorate, they can, deta- they can decay. And that is, is not the case. And it's not simply getting better as everyone may perceive. Well, you know, the way I see it, this is better. And the way I see it, that is better. No, we're told right here in Ephesians chapter 4 and uh, verse 15. It says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. So we have as our model, as as the objective, as the goal toward which we are seeking to become like Jesus Christ, that we might grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. We're to grow up to become like Him. The object of our growth, the object of our development, the object of our spiritual maturing is becoming more like Christ. If we're not becoming more like Christ, then we're not growing. That's the means by which we measure growth. Are we taking on more of the attributes and the characteristics of Jesus Christ? And you and I can't do that just on our own by ourselves. We talked before and focused before on the fact that that just on our own strength, by ourselves, we can't transform ourselves from the inside out. But there is the availability of God's help and God's power and God's Spirit uh, to do so. As we come on down here in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, let's just notice verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that you walk not, that you henceforth, you know, from now on, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. Now, if we're going to grow up unto him in all things, 
which is the head, Christ. If we're going to develop toward that end, toward that objective, then what Paul says is that from now on we can't live like everyone else does. And he says they walk in the vanity of their mind. The way I see it, this attitude, this attitude of exalting human reason. Because you see, there is something that is very much superior to human reason. And that is divine revelation. And we either use God's standards or we use our own or we use somebody else's. Can you come up with a, another alternative? Whose standards do you use? You either get your standards from other people. You get them because of just the way you see it, which is influenced by other people. Or you get it from God. Now, he says here, speaking of the nations, that basically people in the world walk in the vanity of their mind. They, they just go the way they see it. Human reasoning, exalting that. And of course the result is that their understanding is darkened. They don't see things clearly like in the bright light of day. And they're alienated. They're cut off. They, they are separated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them. Because of the blindness of their heart. They, they don't really properly perceive things as they are. And they don't have a clear perspective. All we've got to do is just look around at the society we're in and all of the mess and all of the the, uh, the violence and all of the, the upset, all of the just the, the low standards that are so pervasive in our society. Paul goes on in verse 19, he says, Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lawlessness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now, if that's not a description of our culture, of our society, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Those two things sum up, you know, most of the things. Uh, you, you find most advertising is geared to appeal to either uh, unclean thoughts or, or to appeal to greed. I'll tell you very quick, in the advertising profession, sex sells. And that's used. You know, sell everything from hair cream to uh, automobiles uh, that uh, is is built in there. And uh, so we look at people pursuing the way that seems right unto them. Well, the Scripture tells us in Proverbs, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There is a direction that seems logical, seems normal, but it doesn't lead to life. And if we want to know what it leads to, all we have to do is look around. Turn on the television. Watch the evening news. You don't have to watch very much of it to, to get a pretty good idea. You don't have to walk very many streets or look around very far to see the impact that, that this sort of an attitude has on a society. Well, Paul says in verse 20, you have not so learned Christ. You can't follow Christ and walk in the way of uncleanness and greediness. That's not the way Christ lived his life. He set us an example that we should follow in his steps. That's what we're told uh, there in 1 Peter 2.21. Christ suffered for us, setting us an example that we should follow in his steps. We're to walk as he walked, to live as he lived. So, in verse 21, he goes on, If so be that you have heard him and that you have been taught by him as the truth is in, in Jesus, you know, you've learned, you've been taught, what have you... What's the result of that? Verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conduct the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. There's a deceitfulness to lust. We kid ourselves. We play games with ourselves. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, we're told in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. First and foremost, the primary ingredient of human nature is self-deceit. We kid ourselves. We justify ourselves. And we're going to see as we go on that there are things that are definite roadblocks to change and to grow. To growing up to become like Jesus Christ. So he says you have to put off. 
the form of conduct, the way we used to live. We have to put off the old man. The old man, it was based on an old set of values, an old way of looking at things. It was corrupt. You have to be renewed, verse 23, in the spirit of your mind. The renewal takes place in our heart and in our mind. It's a renewal that begins on the inside. And then we put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. It is a new man that is described by the law of God and the way of God. It is created in righteousness. What is righteousness? Psalm 119, verse 172. All thy commandments are righteousness. True holiness. A true sanctity of uh, life that is, is indicative of Christ living in us. Moving away from uncleanness, the things that pollute, the things that distort. Putting away a lie. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. Remembers one of another. See, the law of God is put into action in our lives. How do you apply this in a practical way? Paul said, well, here's some examples. You put away lying. See, one of the commandments says, don't bear false witness. So you put away lying. Speak the truth to your neighbor because we're members one of another. We're connected with one another. And when deceit and lying and misrepresentation, when that is extant in a society, everybody is torn down and is hurt and is hampered by it. So we have to put away that, speak the truth. Verse 26, Be you angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. You see, the commandment says don't murder. Where does murder start? It starts in the heart and in the mind with the spirit of anger, the spirit of resentment and hostility. He said, be you angry and sin not. Now the scripture does not say, don't ever be angry. God created us with emotions and God created us with the ability to get angry and there are certainly things that call for anger. What he said is, be you angry and sin not. You see, there is a distinction We are to be angry, but not to sin. How do you do that? Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Don't hold a grudge. Don't build up a resentment. Don't get in in an attitude of resentment towards someone. Because if you let the sun go down on your wrath, you, you brew on a resentment towards someone. You are giving place to the devil. You're opening a way for the devil to get in and to, and to help cultivate an attitude of Bitterness, which is really the spirit of murder. Murder is something that a lot of times people don't follow through with simply because they're afraid of the consequences. But you see, if we don't apply verses 26 and 27, then we are violating the spirit of murder. We're violating the spirit of murder. We have that attitude in our hearts and minds. And if you have the attitude, given the right set of circumstances, the right opportunity, what would be to keep from going ahead and doing it? Verse 28, he says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needs. Again, expounding another commandment, expounding the eighth commandment that we are not to steal. And and the implication of that is that we're to work, we're to be productive, uh, we're to be helping and giving and sharing. Uh, We are to do something positive. That is the spirit of the law. Now, he goes on down in verse 29. He says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may... Minister grace unto the hearers. Now, this could certainly uh, is an amplification of, of the uh, commandment that we're not to we're not to blaspheme, uh, we're not to uh, no corrupt communication, no rotten speech. That's what the word corrupt means: something that's rotting or decaying. So, speech that is not rotten, that's not decadent, that's uh, 
not blasphemous. What we say is very important. What proceeds out of our mouth ought to be what's good. To the use of edifying. That just means to build up. The things that we say ought to be things that are good, things that are constructive, things that are upbuilding, uh, things that, uh, speech that has a certain gracious quality to it. Verse 30, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed until the day of redemption. You know, God's Spirit, as we're going to see here in just a few moments, God's Spirit is the thing that, that's the, the power, the agency that works with our mind. And we grieve the Holy Spirit when we don't respond to God's lead. You know, as God says back in, in Genesis chapter 6, I believe it's verse 5, when he says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Now this was in the days of the flood. These were in the day, this was in the time prior to, to the flood of Noah, when the situation on earth was deteriorating step by step. It was getting increasingly worse. And God said, as he looked at the circumstance and looked at the lack of responsiveness for, from human beings, he said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. And at that point, he set a time limit of 120 years. And at the end of that 120-year period, Noah uh, entered into the ark and his family with him and the flood came and human life was wiped out. And things started over. Breathe not the Holy Spirit. Don't resist the leading of God's Spirit. You know, sometimes God's Spirit pricks at our conscience. And there are times that we may respond, and there are times we tune it out. We know we shouldn't, but it's sort of like, well, I'll sin now and repent later. How genuine will that later repentance be? The Spirit is what seals us until the day of redemption. It's what authenticates us as the genuine article. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be you kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. That's crucial. The attitude of vengeance and retaliation and holding a grudge and getting even, replaced with an attitude of forgiveness, an attitude of kindness, of trying to help and to share. There are changes that are called. There are changes that are called for in your life and in mine. And who's the limiting factor in those changes taking place? Is, is the limiting factor God? You know, is it, is it the fact that, uh, you know, what God's able to do? No, over and over, brethren, we, we limit God. Now, how do we limit God? We limit God's working in our life. And I'll give you two key areas how we limit God. We limit God through unbelief, and we limit God through unresponsiveness. We limit Him through unbelief. I, I, Israel of old did that. Notice back in Psalm 78. Psalm 78, which goes through and rehearses the story of the congregation of Israel in the wilderness. And we read in, in uh, Psalm 78, verse 40, uh, verse 40, How oft did they provoke Him in the wilderness and grieve Him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited the Holy One of Israel. How did they limit God? Well, they remembered not His hand nor the day which He delivered them from the enemy, how He had wrought His signs in Egypt and His wonders in the field of Zoan, and it turned their rivers unto blood, and their floods that they could not eat, sent diverse sorts of flies among them which devoured them, and frogs which destroyed them, gave their increase unto the caterpillar, and their labor unto the locust. He destroyed their vines. Uh, we're told on down... Uh, all sorts of things. Uh, in verse 49, he cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. He made a way to his, to his anger. He spared not their soul from death. He gave their life over to the pestilence, smote all the firstborn of Egypt, the chief of their strength, and the tabernacles of Ham. He did all of these things. And he 
made his own people to go forth like sheep, guided them in the wilderness, led them on to safety. Uh, verse 54, brought them over the border of this sanctuary, even to, his, to this mountain. He did all of these things. But they limited the Holy One of Israel. How did they limit the Holy One of Israel? They limited Him through unbelief. And that we find uh, over and over. You see, they didn't really take seriously what God had done. God became unreal to them and they, well, they limited God through unbelief. Doubt and fear can stand in our way of being able to grow. Because we limit God's working in us through a lack of faith. A lack of faith can come through either as a doubt about God's Word and a fear of the consequences if we do what God says. Israel of old failed to go forward into the promised land because they were overwhelmed with fear. They were afraid of the giants that lay before them and they were so uh, just absolutely overcome that they were unable to function and they, they, they refused to respond. All they did was complain and bawl and bellyache. And God was not pleased. They limited the Holy One of Israel. They continually doubted whether or not God meant what he says. You know, faith is not something that comes easily and that comes naturally and normally. Faith goes against the grain because we're told in Hebrews 11 verse 1 that faith is the evidence of things not seen. It's the substance of things hoped for. Faith isn't based on what you can see and touch and taste and feel. Faith, faith isn't based on the physical around. You know, humanly, all of us like to walk by sight. We like to see what we're going to set our foot on next. And the idea of just, in that sense, putting our hand in Christ's hand and walking with Him. When with our eyes we can't see where we're going, that can be a frightening thing. And sometimes we take a little step or two and we get scared. And we go running back to what we can see. We limit God's ability to work in us. Notice, you can go through in Psalm 78, and it's incredible. You know, all of the things that are brought out, it says... Uh, uh, in verse 22, they, be, they believed not in God and trusted not in His salvation, though He had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them the corn of heaven. Man did eat angels' food. God provided. And still they doubt. And we look and we shake our heads and cluck our tongues and say, Oh, those pile people. And yet, brethren, how often have we done the same thing? God, who's watched over us, who's answered prayers, who's worked miracles in our lives, and we know that, and yet we get confronted with something and we get scared, and then seemingly the faith goes out the window. And that's happened to all of us at one time or another in one set of circumstances or another. It's happened. And it does happen. And we can find ourselves limiting what God can do in us and through us. Notice in, in Matthew or in Mark chapter 6. It's so all that they limited the Holy One of Israel. Notice in Mark 6 verse 1. This is speaking of Christ. He went out from thence and came into his own country and his disciples followed. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogues, and many hearing him were astonished. And they said, From whence has this man these things? What wisdom is this that which is given unto him? And even such mighty works are wrought in his hands. See, he was back in Galilee, where he'd grown up. Notice what they said, verse 3, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters with us here? And they were offended at him. Who does this guy think he is? Why? I know him. 
I saw him grow up. He used to run that carpenter shop down the street. Why, his brothers still live right here, and his sisters, his mother, she's still living, lives lives just down the road from me. I, I know him. Where does he get off saying all these things? Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, except he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. You see, they limited the Holy One of Israel through their unbelief. They found it so difficult to really believe what he said. They looked at the things that they had known. You see, what they could see block out what they couldn't see. Christ worked far more mighty miracles in areas where the people had never known Him. But somehow coming back there, they looked and they said, I don't see how someone that I've known for all these years, someone that I saw grow up, I don't see how He could do all those things. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Doubts and fears stand in our way many times of being able to grow because, you see, in order to grow, we have to step out in faith. Faith is an essential quality and an essential ingredient. But our doubts and our fears stand in our way of walking. In faith. We limit God through unbelief. We limit God through unresponsiveness to His leading in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 and verse 51. Notice here, this is Stephen's sermon. And he talked about, sort of rehearsed the history of the nation. Over and over you find where God goes through and He rehearses certain events. He rehearses past history. Because you see, human nature has not changed down through the centuries. People get in similar circumstances and they do similar things. And if we will look, if we will look at how God has worked and how God has dealt, if we will look at what God does, we will be in a position to learn lessons we need in our lives. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen says here, we'll pick it up uh, uh, in verse 48, or verse 47. Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the Most High dwells not in temples made with hands, as says the prophet. Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard in ears, you do always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so did you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them with and they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have now been the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Boy, Stephen really told it to them like it was. Well, we're going to see a little of their response here in, in a little bit, but uh, notice what he said. He said, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit works to convict us of sin. There are those who resist God's Spirit. They resist that lead because they want their own way. Self-will is one of the hardest things, perhaps the hardest thing to turn loose of. Self-will. Fundamentally, deep down, every one of us, we want our way. A lot of prayers are spent trying to talk God into seeing it our way. We've written the script and we want Him to memorize His lines and read them properly. And if he doesn't choose to do so, we're frustrated. Because God hasn't written, hasn't read the lines we wrote for him. And sometimes we get mad with other people because they didn't read the lines we wrote for them either. 
want to be the producer, the director, the, the star of the show. We want to write the lines and have everyone read their part. And brethren, if we're going to grow, we can't write the script. God's already written the script. But you know, all of us, one time or another, to one degree or another, we resist the Holy Spirit. Because if you didn't resist the Holy Spirit, and if I didn't resist the Holy Spirit, we would always do the right thing, wouldn't we? When's the last time you didn't do the right thing or say the right thing? See, how sensitive are we? He says, you resist the Holy Spirit. Now, some resist the Holy Spirit uh, in, in, in an almost entire way. They just, they harden themselves. And we can fill our minds with things that harden and sear our conscience. And when you knowingly do what you know you shouldn't do over and over, you're hardening your conscience just the same as as you can harden your hands. You know, sometimes somebody that uh, has worked out has worked outside and done a lot of hard manual labor, uh, boy, their, their their hands can be just as uh, as hard and tough, thick calluses. You know that that has that that skin that starts out so fresh and tender on a little tiny baby has been thickened and toughened over a period of years. The same can happen with our conscience. We can thicken and toughen to where the pricks of God's Spirit aren't felt nearly so much. In Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 3, let's notice down here Turn, it talks about in verse 7, certain individuals. In verse, in verse 5, it says that they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. They deny the authority thereof. They have a form of godliness. They have an outward form of religion, but they don't want God telling them how to live their lives. In verse 7, they're ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, these were Pharaoh's two magicians. Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. You see, Janus and Jambres were there with Pharaoh. They saw Moses and Aaron come in. They saw the miracles that were worked. They worked a few false miracles themselves. They sort of ran out of soap after about the third one. But you know what they had to do is they stood there with all of their incantations, with all their demonic uh, religion. Because these were men who were leaders in the religion of Egypt. These were high priests of the Egyptian paganism. And you know what they did? They resisted the truth. That's what it says right here in verse 8. They resisted the truth. They did not want to believe what Moses said. They resisted the truth. They looked for excuses. They tried to maneuver and move around it. They resisted the truth. And there are people all the way down through history who resist the truth. You see, we limit God's ability to work in our lives through unbelief and through Outright resistance through unresponsiveness. Because you see, God does work with us. And God deals and God has ways of correcting us. And yet some profit by that and others do not. And none of us profit as fully as we could. We can all learn to profit more. And see, that's essential not to look around comparing ourselves among ourselves and think, well, I may not profit a whole lot, but I think I profit more than she does, he does. I think they're worse than I am. They've been around for a long time. And man, you will see what they did. I heard her say something last week. I didn't do that. You know, we can get bogged down in, in focusing on what other people are doing and other people's failures. 
and not concentrate on the only human being on the face of this earth that you and I can change. And the only person on the face of this earth you can change is you. And the only person on the face of this earth I can change is me. And when our focus is on other people, something seemingly, if, if they would be different, my world would be okay. Life would be fine. The birds would be singing. The sky would be blue if they would change. If she would be different, if he would be different. Well, that's not the way it is. If we weren't dissatisfied with them, we'd be dissatisfied with something else. No, we're told in Hebrews 11, or Hebrews 12 rather, that God chastens us. He deals with us. In verse 5 of Hebrews 12, you've forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not you the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you're rebuked of Him. Don't get upset when God corrects you. Don't disregard it. Don't just sort of give up and quit. Whom the Lord loves, He chastens and scourges every son whom He receives. You see, if we're going to grow, if we're going to learn, if we're going to be guided, we need a certain correction. And God does that. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. What son is he whom the father chastens not? The implication clearly is the a son that the father loves and acknowledges. A father who really, really properly cares about his children is going to correct them and give them discipline. If he doesn't, he obviously doesn't care enough to guide them in the right way. Paul says, if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. You, God doesn't even consider you his. We've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection into the Father of spirits and live? They truly for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. They did it the way that seemed right to them. He for our profit that we might be partakers of His holiness. You know, our human parents did the best they could. They didn't do it perfectly and none of us as human parents have done it perfectly. But you know what? God doesn't make any mistakes. Inevitably, always, every time when God chastens us, it is for our profit. It's for our good. It is to lead to a result, and that result is that we might be partakers of His holiness. He wants us to become like Him, to grow up in all things to be like Christ. That we might partake, we might share forever and the life that God has. God is calling us to be a part of His family, but if we're going to be there, we've got to, we've got to grow, we've got to overcome, we've got to share in His holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. When you're going through it, it's not enjoyable. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. That's not where the period is. Notice it. That's not where the period is. There is an if. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Oh, you see, we go through it. How do we respond? It produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those that are exercised thereby. We are developed, we are worked with that way. But you see, there are those who are not exercised thereby. There are those who give up, who quit, who refuse to respond, who resist the Holy One of Israel and who limit Him through unbelief. They can refuse God's chastening. Let's notice back in Luke 10. You know, God corrects us in a variety of ways. He corrects us through circumstances. It can be a means of correcting. Uh, He can correct us through His Word, uh, through His written Word, or through His servants. There are different ways that God can convey and and get something across. But let's notice here in in Luke 10. In verse 25. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. 
So here he was, his motive in asking a question. The question was not a bad question. But his motive in asking the question was to try to trip him up. Now we see an attitude here. A certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now he didn't say, do? Why, you don't need to do anything. You've already got it. You know, he... Uh, Christ acknowledged that there is something you have to do. Christ said to him, verse 26, What is written in the law? How do you read? What did the Scripture say? He said, you're a lawyer. You read the law. What, what is said? Now, Christ evidently didn't know that the Old Testament had been done away. Well, this was a dirty trick he was playing on this guy and, and, and telling him to refer back to the Old Testament when, when really that was all done away anyway. Well, I'm being ridiculous because, of course, it wasn't done away. Christ said, well, what do you read? You, you read the Bible. You, you study the Scriptures. You're, you're a lawyer. You have studied the law. What does it say? And he answering said, verse 27, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You see, he quoted Deuteronomy 6.5, and he quoted Leviticus 19.18. And verse 28, see, he knew the answer. He asked the question, and he knew the answer to it. When Christ put him on the spot, he responded, and Jesus said in verse 28, You have answered right, this do, and you shall live. This do, and you shall live. Verse 29, And he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, unto Jesus And who is my neighbor? Notice what his motive was, and willing to justify himself. He was looking for an excuse to stay the way he was. And he wanted to argue about who was his neighbor. And this is where Christ gave him the story, uh, told the story of the Good Samaritan. Remember, he ended the story and said, who was a neighbor to the fellow that was wounded and beaten up? Who played the role of a neighbor? Well, it was that stranger, it was that Samaritan. He was in the role of being a neighbor. Now, here was an individual who, whose response, whose approach, you see, he couldn't be corrected. He couldn't learn and profit from the discussion he had with Jesus Christ. He couldn't even profit from a discussion with Jesus Christ because his attitude was trying to justify himself. He was looking for a reason to stay the way he was. And you see, brethren, we will never change and grow if what we're looking for is a reason to stay the way we are. If we're looking for a reason to justify our actions. Well, the way I see it, and I don't see that this is so bad, and I think this, you know, and, and we get into all these justifications. This fellow wanted to wrangle about what the definition of neighbor was. Now let's notice another example. Luke chapter 16. Let's pick it up in verse 10. Jesus said, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. It's a pattern of character. It's a matter of character. If therefore... You have not been faithful in the unrighteous manner. Who will commit unto your trust the true riches? If you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold of the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You can't serve two masters. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. They made fun of it. They ridiculed what he was saying. And he said unto them, You are they which justify yourselves before men. You see, they started making excuses for why they were the way they were. He said, You are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knows your heart. 
that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the, in the sight of God. They justified themselves. They made excuses for themselves. See, that's a way we can refuse God's chastening. We don't respond to God's chastening because we're looking for excuses as to why it's okay that we're the way we are. And so we can't learn and profit when we look through the Scriptures, when we read God's Word instead of being corrected and chastened, we wind up looking for excuses to justify why this wasn't so bad or that wasn't so bad or somebody misunderstood us. Oh, it's amazing what we can rationalize and justify. You consider every atrocity that's ever been committed some way or another, the person justified it to himself. The fellow that blew up the building in Oklahoma. Regardless of what all the circumstances were, and we don't know all the factors that were involved, but one factor I know. He justified it to himself. He justified it to himself. He rationalized committed, the person that did it somehow rationalized or justified to himself that it was okay. So there's no limit to how much we can rationalize and justify. But brethren, we can never grow. We can never go forward as long as we're coming to God with our list of excuses for why it's okay. You see, this right here, here, here were examples of individuals who justified themselves. And you know, sometimes what people do is they just get so angry at the messenger. Well, we read the account of Stephen's sermon. And Stephen told them in Acts 7.51 that you do always resist the Holy Spirit. He really told it to them. And what did they do? Verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. It really cut. It was true and it penetrated. And you know what their response was? They got mad. Gnashed on him with their teeth. Verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city and stoned him. They were infuriated. They wouldn't listen to another word he said. Now what did he tell them? He said, you're resisting the Holy Spirit. Just like your ancestors did and that made them mad. You know why they got so mad? Because they were guilty of what he said. And it cut. You ever had somebody say something to you and in one, on one level you knew it was true, it cut. And your first response was to lash out at the person that said it. Because they had really hit home. And it really upset you. You know, that's, that's a normal response. Human response. We can look through the Bible and we can see all sorts of, of human responses. We can look at the story of Saul. And we can read of his progression down a slide of what we would term mental illness until he became so absolutely paranoid that he felt threatened by everyone and everything. You remember the story. Saul started out, he was sort of an insecure person when they were going to uh, call him up to anoint him as king. They had to find him first because he was hiding back there in the closet. Uh, he got so nervous and upset having to come up in front of everybody that he went and hid. And they got him and he was chosen king. But Saul was an ineffective leader because he tried to deal with his insecurities the wrong way. You see, there's a carnal way and there's a spiritual way to deal with all the problems. The fact that Saul was insecure, everybody's insecure to some way or another in certain circumstances or another. How do you deal with it? Well, Saul was going to try and cover it up. And, and, and put a lot of bluff and bluster up front. He got nervous, you know. Samuel was a little late showing up. So Saul made the sacrifice himself, which he shouldn't have done. And he made excuses. He was given specific instructions about 
destroying the, uh, the Amalekites and their property. Samuel came up and here all, you know, Saul said, look, I have done just exactly what you said. Samuel got there and he said, well, what's all this bleeding of sheep and lowing of oxen that I hear? Oh, well, now, the, the people, they, they saved back the best and, and I think they were going to offer them as sacrifices for God. That, yeah, that's, that's, that's why we, we got all this. He began making excuses. He caved in. Maybe the people did say, why don't we have to kill all this stuff? Let's, let's save some of it. Saul was an individual who easily felt threatened, but you know, he was a person who, instead of letting God fight his battles for him, he tried to cover it up. Later on, you know, he was afraid and intimidated, just like everyone else, to go out and face Goliath. Goliath was a giant, but you remember Saul stood head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. Who do you think people were thinking of when Goliath came out and taunted the land, ta- taunted the army? Who do you think they were thinking of? Don't you think that they were saying, well, you know, Saul is, is the biggest guy we've got, and he's the king after all. Why well, He stands head and shoulders above me. If he's not going to go out there, why should I? Don't you think that Saul was a little bit uncomfortable and he knew that people were talking about that? That's normal, you see, and this thing dragged on for 40 days. It was a war of nerves. And when finally David, a young shepherd boy, went out there and slew Goliath, David went out in faith and confidence. You know, Goliath came and he was he was angry at who was coming out against him. Here was this young fellow you know, perhaps about 19 years of age, something like that. The age of joining the army in ancient Israel was 20, and so David's brothers were in the army, but he wasn't. So he very likely was was maybe 18 or 19. And he came out there and looked young. You know, here was this great big uh, bearded Philistine, and here was this, uh, uh, you know, young fellow out here, 18 or 19, with... Uh, uh, not even a not even a full beard. And uh, Goliath said, well, am I a dog? You come out to me with a stick? Because David had his shepherd's staff in his hand and he had his slingshot. And you remember what David's response was? He said, you know, he says, you have defied the armies of the living God. I come to you in the name of the God of Israel whom you have defied. He said, Goliath, you have challenged the wrong one. You, the challenge is not to me as a person. The challenge is to God. And in a matter of seconds, Goliath was dead. And his head was cut off with his own sword. David didn't need to bring a sword. He just used Goliath. Probably all he could do to pick the thing up and chop with it. Well, you remember, it was a time of great celebration and people were celebrating and songs were sung and David was the hero And Saul began to brood and get in a black mood. Because they were singing songs. You know, Saul had slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. All that made Saul mad. Because David was the hero of the moment. Saul's insecurity and his fears began to build up. And you remember the story, the progression. Where after a while, Saul began to get into these black moods. Finally, the time came when They were sitting there and Saul picked up a spear and a javelin and tried to kill David, threw it at him. David dodged out of the way. Saul wound up on a a hunt for David. He put a price on David's head. He viewed everyone as an enemy. He even slaughtered some of the priests because he thought that they had given food to David. Became so obsessed finally died by his own hand in battle. When he lost the battle, he committed suicide. It's a sad study in Saul's progression. A man who became increasingly obsessed and dominated by his fears, by his insecurities, by the resentment that he built up, increasingly paranoid, viewing everyone as an enemy. Everybody was out to get him. 
Well, President Nixon wasn't the first one to come up with an enemies list. People have been doing that for a long time. Saul had his. And the time came when it included almost everyone, including his own son at one time, as you see. He became distrustful. Saul didn't grow. He didn't overcome. He didn't make progress through those fears and insecurities. They overcame him. You can look at the story of Ahab. A man who was absolutely incapable of dealing with disappointment. Very manipulative individual who sought to get his way. Tried to buy, you know, he was king of Judah, or king of Israel rather. Wanted to buy a vineyard. Wanted to buy Naboth's vineyard that adjoined his, his powers. Offered Naboth money. Naboth said, no, I don't want to sell. You know, it's mine. Been the family for years. I don't want to sell it. Ahab came home and boy was he mad. He handled disappointment about like a two-year-old. You can read the account for the sake of time. I won't, but he came in, slammed the door, got in bed, turned his face toward the wall and pouted. Wouldn't even eat supper. His wife finally came in and said, what's wrong with you? He said, I wanted to buy Naboth's vineyard. You wouldn't sell it to me. Boy, was he upset. Well, she connived and maneuvered around and got the vineyard, but you can read later of, of Ahab how he conned the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, into coming up and giving him aid. How he got mad at the true prophet of God who told him what the outcome of everything was going to be. Then he tried to manipulate the outcome by because he knew that the king was going to be killed that day, so he got Jehoshaphat, sort of maneuvered him into dressing up in full regalia and go charging out in the chariot, while Ahab got rid of everything that, that marked him as king and went dressed, you know, in old clothes out there and sort of sit on the sidelines to see what was going on. Thought he could maneuver and manipulate the situation. He was an individual, you know, when, when there were all sorts of problems in the land and, and great drought and everything. When he saw, when he saw Elijah, he said, you're the one that troubles Israel. Why, you're the one that caused all these problems and all this drought. Because you see, Elijah had announced the drought. Ahab said, you're the one that troubles Israel. And Elijah said, no, you're the one that troubles Israel. You and your father's house and all the sins that you've committed, that's the reason the nation is going to pot. You're mad at me because I'm telling you the truth. You've got the curse of God on the nation because of disobedience and you're blaming the messenger. You view me as having caused all your problems. You've caused your own problems, Ahab. Ahab did not grow. Ahab dealt with Elijah. He dealt with God's servants. But Ahab resisted. You can resist passively. You can resist actively. Ahab never really went forward and changed. You can look at other examples. What about Haman? You remember Haman? He's mentioned in the book of Esther. You talk about a man that was that was obsessed with, with wanting to be important and wanting to be recognized. He had a high status in the Persian government, but he was dissatisfied with that. He wanted everybody to give him obeisance, to just sort of grovel like a dog when he came. And there was a man who refused to do so, Mordecai the Jew, who refused to bow down and to grovel. And Haman was upset, and he became so obsessed with Mordecai that he wanted to wipe out all the Jews. Now, is that a rational response? But Mordecai, or Haman, became so obsessed with that, and he plotted and he manipulated and finally built this huge gallows. Do you remember who ultimately hung on that gallows? It wasn't Mordecai. It was Haman. It was Haman. He ultimately fell prey to the very plot he himself had started. You see, here individuals in the Scriptures are filled with examples of individuals who profited and who grew and who overcame and were transformed in their lives and those who were not. And as we study God's Word, if we study it with faith, and with responsiveness. 
believing God. Allowing God to work in our lives, seeking to respond, have, seeking to, to have a tender conscience. We can learn, we can grow, we can profit. You know, David made mistakes too. And yet he was a man after God's own heart. One of the key, one of the keys to that, one of the keys to the growth that David made in his own life is contained right here in Psalm 51. David's Psalm of Repentance. Psalm 51, verse 3, David writes, For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you might be justified when you speak and be clear when you judge. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. You desire truth in the inward part. In the hidden part you shall make me to know wisdom. David said, I acknowledge my transgression. You go through the account when Nathan confronted David and you don't find a single excuse. You see, what that meant was that David was not putting up barriers and roadblocks that prevented growth. What David had to go through was a very painful time and there were some hard lessons that he learned in his life and there were some serious consequences that he suffered in his family as a result of mistakes that he had made. But one barrier to growth that David did not have, and that was David did not resist the Holy One of Israel. David didn't offer excuses, and people have been offering excuses ever since Adam offered an excuse to God. God asked him a yes or no question, and Adam gave an excuse. He said, have you eaten of the tree that I told you not to eat of? You know what? Yes or no. All you've got to do is say one word. Adam said, well, now the woman that you gave me. Implication being, of course, that somehow God really was the blame because he said, the woman that you gave me. You remember, you, you brought her over here. Life was just fine. And you brought me this woman and, and she took of the tree and did eat. And I sort of took a little bite too. He started out making an excuse. And people have been doing that all the way down. That's human nature. That's human nature. It's someone else's fault. I'm getting a raw deal. You don't understand. Of course, none of us have ever done any of that. I know, but maybe you know someone that has. David said, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. You can't ever work on something you don't see. You can't work on a problem you don't see. You can't work on a problem you don't admit. And you'll never turn loose of something you want to hold on to. You may lay it down for a moment if somebody's standing there and putting pressure on you, but if you don't want to turn loose of it, you'll grab it back and get it. The only changes any of us will ever make are changes that we genuinely want to make. But brethren, if we see, if we really grasp what God has in store for us, what it means to be a partaker, a sharer in His holiness, if we grasp what God has in mind for us, then we have incentive to change. We have incentive to grow up unto Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. There's a motive, there's a reason for growth. You know, it's not easy to see ourselves as God sees us. We have to ask Him to show us. We have to spend time studying His Word and looking at those examples and meditating on them. Meditating on them, turning them over in our minds and seeing how we, as you read examples, how would you have responded? What would you do? What do you do in similar circumstances? Think about it. Meditate on it. Look for lessons you can learn. Recognize that God is working in us and through us both to will and to do of His own good pleasure. But we can limit the Holy One of Israel through unbelief. We can resist the Holy Spirit, but we do that to our own detriment. Because if we will be exercised, by the chastening through which we go. 
if we will learn from it, if we will go to God for the faith and for the responsive heart and mind. Because those are things that have to come from God and if we ask Him for them, He will, He will help us. Then we can go forward. We can become what God has called us to be. We can grow up unto Him, which is the head in all things, Jesus Christ. We can genuinely overcome through the power of God's Spirit. We have a tremendous opportunity that God has called us to share in. Let's make sure we esteem that opportunity as vital and as important. And let's make sure that we do the things we need to do to respond to the leading of God.